Hello, everyone. My name is Faye Rosenfeld, and I'm the Vice President of Public Programs at the New York Public Library. I want to thank you for joining us for an evening of Raised Voices, classic speeches from feminist pioneers. Tonight's program takes place in the wake of events that have caused us all great despair. The pandemic, hijacked politics, an armed attack on the Capitol, and enduring and overwhelming racial injustice. But it is also happening on the eve of an event that brings much hope the historic inauguration of the nation's first female vice president of color, Kamala Harris. And it follows an election in which record numbers of women, in particular women of color, were elected to Congress. We at Live from NYPL are taking this moment to celebrate and pay tribute to the historic and continuing contributions of women, and in particular women of color, toward the advancement of civil rights, racial equity, and the ever elusive goal of living up to our nation's founding ideals. BIPOC women have always stood at the center of this struggle, but in a country that has privileged white stories and of course the stories of men, the lives, words, and actions of many of those heroic foremothers have been for overshadowed. Tonight is our attempt to offer one small corrective to that record. Tomorrow, history is going to be made. Tonight, we're going to reflect and amplify history that was already made, if not always acknowledged. The inauguration has us thinking about speeches, so we're shining a light on inspiring speeches and writings all delivered roughly a century ago by BIPOC American feminist activists, women whose contributions to the causes of racial equity, citizenship, voting rights, and more have been pivotal. Their words and the ideals they fought for resonate as loudly today as they did a century and more ago, for better and for worse. We are proud to present a remarkable group of women who will read these words and also contextualize the lives and work of their authors. Tonight was made possible with one indispensable tool, a New York Public Library card. We discover these writings in our own NYPL collections, which are accessible to everyone. We'll link to some of them on the event page, but there's an endless world you can discover on your own. If you already have a New York Public Library card, please consider tonight an invitation to explore more. And if you don't have a library card yet, you can apply for one online at nypl.org slash library card. This is our first Live from NYPL event of 2021, and we have many, many more coming up. We would love to see you again. So to learn more about what's on and to register, please go to nypl.org slash live. Okay, let's get to it. Introducing the first of tonight's readings is the library's own Rhonda Evans, the Assistant Chief Librarian at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. Please welcome Rhonda. Hello, my name is Rhonda Evans, and I am the Assistant Chief Librarian of the Jean Blackwell Hudson Research and Reference Division at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. Mary Church Terrell was born in Memphis, Tennessee in 1863, the same year the Emancipation Proclamation was issued. Terrell, one of the first African-American women to earn a master's degree, was the founding president of the National Association for Colored Women and a founding member of the NAACP. She worked as an educator, lecturer, and dedicated her life to activism. She actively fought for women's suffrage, to repeal Jim Crow legislation, and for the desegregation of public schools. Her tireless work for equality in the face of so many obstacles is a great inspiration to myself to never give up the fight. The speech you are about to hear was published as an essay in August 1915 in the Crisis Magazine, which you can access at the Schomburg Center Research and Reference Division and many other places online. The Research and Reference Division also proudly holds a first edition of Terrell's autobiography, A Colored Woman in a White World, first published in 1940. I am pleased to introduce Tanya Pinkins, who will read Mary Church Terrell's work Women's Suffrage and the 15th Amendment. Even if I believe that women should be denied the right of suffrage, wild horses could not drag such an admission from my pen or my lips. For this reason, 
Precisely the same arguments used to prove that the ballot be withheld from women are advanced to prove that colored men should not be allowed to vote. The reasons for repealing the 15th Amendment differ but little from the arguments advanced by those who oppose the enfranchisement of women. Consequently, nothing could be more inconsistent than that colored people should use their influence against granting the ballot to women if they believe colored men should enjoy this right which citizenship confers. What could be more absurd and ridiculous than that one group of individuals who are trying to throw off the yoke of oppression themselves so as to get relief from conditions which handicap and injure them should favor laws and customs which impede the progress of another unfortunate group and hinder them in every conceivable way. For the sake of consistency, therefore, if my sense of justice were not developed at all and I could not reason intelligently as a colored woman, I should not tell my dearest friend that I opposed women's suffrage. But how can anyone who is able to use reason and who believes in dealing out justice to all God's creatures think it is right to withhold from one half the human race rights and privileges freely accorded to the other half, which is neither more deserving nor more capable of exercising them. For 2000 years, mankind has been breaking down the various barriers which interpose themselves between human beings and their perfect freedom to exercise all the faculties with which they were divinely endowed. Even in old monarchies, old fetters which formerly restricted freedom dwarfed the intellect and doomed certain individuals to narrow circumscribed spheres because of the mere accident of birth are being loosed and broken one by one. In view of such wisdom and experience, the political subjection of women in the United States can be likened only to a relic of barbarism or to a spot on the sun or to an octopus holding this Republic in its hideous grasp so that further progress to the best form of government is impossible and that precious ideal its founders promised it would be, it seems nothing more tangible than a mirage. My name is Julie Golia, and I'm the curator of history, social sciences, and government information at the New York Public Library. I'm pleased to introduce our next piece, which is an untitled lecture first given in partial form by Suzette LaFleche, also known as Bright Eyes, before the Congregational Club in New York in 1880. Suzette LaFleche was an indigenous American writer, activist, educator, and artist. The daughter of an Omaha chief, LaFleche was born in 1854. She was raised steeped in tribal traditions, but also attended mission school where she learned English and developed her prodigious talent for writing. In 1878, LaFleche served as interpreter for Ponca Chief Standing Bear in the US District Court. The case established the precedent that Native Americans must be recognized as persons before the law. In her journalistic writing and on speaking tours throughout the United States and Europe, LaFleche was committed to revealing the inhumane conditions of federal reservations and the systematic mistreatment of Native Americans. She died in 1903 in her Omaha land allotment. LaFleche established a legacy of outspoken advocacy for the rights of Native Americans that has influenced generations of activists. NYPL's collections include a number of biographies of LaFleche, as well as an 1898 book, Umaha Tawatha, authored by Fanny Reed Giffen and illustrated by LaFleche. LaFleche's lecture will be read by Danielle Geller, a writer of personal essays and memoir. Geller's first book, Dog Flowers, was published by One World Random House and came out just last week. It tells the intimate story of her return home to the Navajo Nation to retrace her mother's life. She is a member of the Navajo Nation, born to the Sitna Jinni, born of the Bilagana. 
My people have made desperate struggles year after year for a hundred years for their homes, for their lives, and for their liberty. They have writhed under a powerful oppressor. It has been said that the government system has been one of alternate pauperizing and butchery. From time to time during these hundred years, there have arisen kind men and just men, judges and senators, who have tried to compel the government to right these wrongs and to change its system. From time to time, parties have arisen like this. To insist that these wrongs be righted and compel the government to change its course for the future, but they have always been beaten. It has been said that you cannot compel the government to right a wrong unless the people demand it. I do not know whether it is because the people do not know enough or care enough to demand justice for a handful of helpless people in the absolute control of one government official who has unlimited authority to kill and butcher if they do not obey his imperious will or whether it is because this one government official is greater than the people who elect him, or he is so great in himself that he can afford to defy public opinion, or he has made money out of it. It is your place to find out which. During the last three years, three tribes, the Nez Perses, the Pancas, and the Cheyennes, have been forcibly removed from their homes into strange lands where many had died in hopeless anguish. What did these tribes do in their defense? You know they would have been less than men if they had submitted meekly like slaves to the authority of this one government official at Washington. The Nez Perses resisted, and there are now a feeble remnant of them left in the Indian territory to which they were forced to go. Of the Cheyennes who resisted, not a man is left to tell the tale. What did the Pancas do? They went into the courts with a writ of habeas corpus in their hand, claiming their liberty like men. This one government official sent an order to his attorney to dismiss the case, that they were not persons and were not entitled to the writ of liberty. We offer a solution to the Indian problem. This solution will end all wars. It will end the shedding of the blood of innocent women and children. It will stop all these wrongs which have gone on month after month year after year, for a hundred years. The solution of the Indian problem, as it is called, is citizenship. Like all great questions which have agitated the world, the solution is simple, so simple that men cannot understand it. The question, I believe, is what shall be done with the Indian? One part of the American people try to solve it by crying, exterminate him. The other part cry, civilize him. Forthwith they go to work, tell him that his land shall be his as long as the grass grows and the waters run. We all know that the grass grows and the waters run only as long as it pleases the Secretary of the Interior. They say to him, you must not pass beyond this line without the permission of this man, your agent, whom we place over you, thus effectually preventing him from seeing or moving in any civilization but his own. This, you see, is a lesson in freedom and liberty, their first lesson in the art of civilization. Next comes the lesson in commerce. The government says to the Indian, you must trade only with this man whom we appoint. You must buy from him only and sell to him only all the products of your farm. Then, to crown the whole, the government says, above all, you must do just as we say, or we won't feed you thus putting a premium on idleness. This third lesson is the lesson of industry, manliness, and independence. Last of all, the government says, we have adopted this policy in order to civilize you. Now, why don't you become civilized? As the process of civilization is rather slow, it has having taken the Anglo-Saxon race a thousand years or so to become what they are now, and as the Indian, being a man, objects decidedly to being placed in a nursery subject to the bidding of one man, who may be his inferior in moral character or intelligence, he is termed rebellious or sullen. And if he rises in exasperation, as he often does, he is termed a savage, incapable of civilization, and troops are sent to enforce the lessons. 
when the Indian, being a man, and not a child, or thing, or merely an animal, as some of the would-be civilizers have termed him, fights for his property, liberty, and life, they call him a savage. When the first settlers in this country fought for their property, liberty, and lives, they were called heroes. When the Indian in fighting this great nation wins a battle, it is called a massacre. When this great nation in fighting the Indian wins a battle, it is called a victory. After the Indian is prevented from earning his own living and from taking care of himself by the system of nursing and feeding, although I've heard it reported at different times within the last few years that whole tribes have been found in a state of starvation, he is reported to be incapable of taking care of himself and would starve if the government let him alone. It was because the Ponca chief, Standing Bear, was trying to take care of himself without the help of the government that this powerful government sent out its armed forces to carry him back to the land from which he had fled because the terror of death was on him in that land. It sounds like some strange story to think of this powerful government sending out its armed forces against a miserable little band composed of eight men, 22 women and children, all of them half starved and half of them sick with the malarial diseases caught in the strange climate. When Standing Bear went into court to have his rights tried, the great reformer, Carl Schurz, the Secretary of the Interior, said he was not a person and therefore could not come into court. But the government feeds them. Was the government feeding them when it forced them from their land, carried them to a strange, unbroken country, reeking with malaria, there to live in canvas tents, and likely to starve because this great government, after having robbed them of their houses, lands, and tools to work with, failed to issue them rations for three months. This is not a solitary instance, but this happened again and again to many other tribes and will happen again and again till this whole system is abolished. It is either extermination or citizenship for the Indian. Hi, my name is Jai Young Fan, and I'm a staff writer at the New Yorker magazine, covering China and the Chinese community in North America. Like the Chinese suffragist Mabel Pinghua Li, I was born in China and moved to the U.S. at an early age. Li was only 16 when she led a parade of New York City suffragists in 1912 to advocate for women's voting rights. Li went on to become the first Chinese woman to earn her doctorate in economics from Columbia University. Li was only 16 when she led a parade of New York City suffragists in 1912 to advocate for women's voting rights. Li went on to become the first Chinese woman to earn her doctorate in economics from Columbia University. She also built the first Chinese Baptist church and the Chinese Community Center in Chinatown, both of which remain integral places for Chinatown residents today. Li cared deeply about making progress for women and immigrants, even when she herself could not immediately enjoy the fruit of her labor. Although the 19th Amendment, which gave women the right to vote, was passed in 1920, Li had to wait over two decades until the repeal of the Chinese Exclusion Act to vote. The essay you're about to hear was written in 1914, even though its examination of race, sex, and class are as relevant to the world we live in today as it was the one in which Li lived a century earlier. Feminism is nothing more than the extension of democracy or social justice and equality of opportunities to women, Li wrote. What would she have made of a world in which her words remain an ideal rather than the reality. I'm pleased to introduce actor Stephanie Xu from the hit show, The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, who will read The Meaning of Woman Suffrage. No matter where we go, we cannot escape hearing about woman suffrage. 
Yet there is hardly a question more misunderstood or that has more misapplications. The idea of women's suffrage at first stood for something abnormal, strange, and extraordinary, and so has finally become the word for anything ridiculous. The idea that women should ever wish to have or be anything more than their primitive mothers appears at first thought to be indeed tragic enough to be comic. But if we sit down and really think it over, throwing aside all sentimentalism, we find that it is nothing more than a wider application of our ideas of justice and equality. We all believe in the idea of democracy. Women's suffrage or the feminist movement is the application of democracy to women. The fundamental principle of democracy is equality of opportunity as distinguished from equality of compensation it means an equal chance for every man to show what his merits are. To my mind, I conceive it as fourfold. For example, having four stages to its development, like four waves, one rolling into another. They are first, moral, religious, or spiritual. Second, legal. Third, political. And fourth, economic. There are great documents giving proof of these stages in the development of democracy. For the spiritual, we have the Sermon on the Mount. For the legal, the Magna Carta or Bill of Rights. For the political, mainly the United States Declaration of Independence. For the economic, the Communist Manifesto by Engels and Marx. In the application of democracy for women, the political is the most immediately pressing demand and is the most conspicuous because it is in the forefront. The spiritual or cultural, the movement for freedom of women to any kind of spiritual self-expression, for freedom from conventionalities, to dress as she likes and to study what she likes, may not seem the most important now, but it will be in the end. Undoubtedly, the economic is the most basic because without it, we cannot have the spiritual. The history of this economic phase divides itself into three stages or conceptions. First, there is the old conception that women, single or married, should remain at home. Then there comes the industrial revolution, taking the industry out of the home and consequently taking the woman out with it. In order to meet this new condition, there next arises a second conception that women must choose from the two prerogatives of either getting married or going out to business. And that as soon as a woman gets married, she must leave her profession and stay at home. The second conception is the one we are living under. But there is a third conception on its way, which says that women, whether married or not, should have economic freedom. If war is one of the worst things for any race, because the bravest are drained off and killed while the cowards are left to be the fathers of the coming generation, we may say that for the interest of eugenics, women should not be forced to choose between marriage and profession because then the able professional woman will lead a life of celibacy while the other is left for the mother of the race. Secondly, since the Industrial Revolution, less and less of occupation is being felt in the home for the mind and body of women. The kindergarten has gone out of the home, industry has gone out with the incoming of the age of machinery, and the care of children is being more and more recognized as a matter for experts, for example, just because she is the mother doesn't any longer mean that she is most capable to arrange her child's diet, discipline, etc. Thus, one half of the people is left almost idle. And the increasing cost of living is due to the fact that women of the higher and middle classes are becoming parasites. Furthermore, 
in the present condition of things, woman is distinctly inferior to man intellectually. This is caused by the lack of having their minds trained in some profession. If man had no systematized work and went idly about the house except for petty chores, he too would be intellectually inferior. The ideal marriage state is a life of comradeship. But there can be no real comradeship unless the two parties are intellectually congenial. And this can only result from giving professions to women. Under the old system, after the marriage, the man continues to develop mentally while the woman stands still. And the result is that after two or three years, the husband feels the lack of companionship at home and rushes to his club or other congenial society at every opportunity. His wife has lost her interest and knowledge of his outside world and has ceased to be his intellectual comrade. And although it must be admitted that a child loses something in not having the mother beside it to supply all its physical needs, Nevertheless, this is overbalanced by having mothers who are intellectual companions. After all, the real need and beauty of maternal affection consists in being always at hand for sympathy and confidence, and not in the performance of petty chores. Besides, if a mother has some intellectual interest to occupy her for part of the day, she is much fresher to take care of her children than if she stays in the house and is nagged by them the whole day long. The position of women is in an unwholesome transitional stage at present in the Western countries. The building up of Western civilization has, as it were, left every other beam loose in its construction by leaving out its women. And now, there naturally has to be a time of difficult and careful readjustment before the structure can be made solid. Hi, my name is Paloma Celis Carvajal, and I am the curator for Latin American, Iberian, and U.S. Latino collections at the New York Public Library. Our next text is Jovita Idar's pro-suffrage piece, Debemos Trabajar, or We Must Work, published in the Texas newspaper La Crónica in 1911, the same year that the first Mexican Congress took place. This meeting was the first attempt in Mexican-American history to organize a militant feminist social movement. Journalist, educator, and political activist, Jovita Idar was born in Laredo, Texas in 1885. Writing for her family's Spanish language newspaper, La Crónica, she denounced educational and social discrimination against Mexican-Americans in the early 20th century. La Crónica is considered an important precursor to the Chicano movement. The piece will be read in the original Spanish and in English. We would like to thank Southern Illinois University Press for allowing us to use this English translation, which was published in the book Mestiza Rhetorics, an anthology of Mexicana activism in the Spanish language press, 1887 to 1922, edited by Jessica Enoch and Cristina Davero Ramirez. And now it is my honor to introduce the next reader, Eric Andiola, an immigration rights activist who is currently Chief Advocacy Officer at the San Antonio-based organization, the Refugee and Immigrant Center for Education and Legal Services, better known as RAICES. Erika's work to defend the rights of immigrants and refugees has been motivated by her own journey as an undocumented woman. She is a fearless leader who, like Idar, 
reminds us of the extraordinary resilience and unlimited potential of Latina women. La mujer moderna, enterada y reconociendo la necesidad de aportar a su contingente para ayudar al desarrollo, a ilustración de los pueblos, se presta valerosa e invade los campos de la industria en todas sus fases sin temor, sin pereza. Abandona la holganza e inacción, puesto que en la época actual, tan llena de oportunidades de vida, tan repleta de energía y de esperanzas, no hay lugar para zánganos sociales. La inacción, indolencia, se ven hoy en día como indignas, y como tal, se desechan por todos aquellos que consideren factores en el desenvolvimiento y progreso de los pueblos. La mujer moderna no pasa sus días arrellanada en cómoda butaca, ni la rica lo hace, puesto que también las alaganadas de la fortuna se dedican a la práctica de la caridad u obras filantrópicas, a la organización de sus clubs benéficos o recreativos, pues lo que desea hacer algo útil para sí o para sus semejantes. La mujer obrera reconociendo sus derechos alza la frente orgullosa y se apronta a la lucha. La época de su degradación ha pasado. Ya no es la esclava vendida por unas cuantas monedas. Ya no es la sierva, sino la igual del hombre, su compañera, siendo este su protector natural y no su amo y señor. Mucho se ha tratado y escrito contra el movimiento feminista, pero a pesar de la oposición, ya en California las mujeres pueden dar su voto como jurados y pueden desempeñar oficinas públicas. Yeran y mucho, esos espíritus descontentazados, superficiales e indignos de una buena obra, críticos de aquella mujer que haciendo a un lado los convencionalismos sociales dedica sus energías a trabajar por algo provechoso o benéfico. Lo que desconociendo la influencia moral que esto acarrea, puesto que la persona dedica a ciertas labores o tareas, no tiene tiempo para ocuparse de las cosas furtiles o perjudiciales. Más hace la constante obra tras las tablas de un mostrador sentada ante su máquina de coser o ya de oficinista, que la señorita holgada de tiempo que se ocupa de ir a visitas diarias o de recorrer uno por uno los establecimientos comerciales, viviente agudo de chismes o cuentos vulgares. La mujer soltera, digna y trabajadora, no exige vida a expensas del jefe de la familia, sea este padre, hermano o pariente. No, una mujer saludable, valerosa y fuerte Dedica sus energías, su talento a ayudar a su familia, o cuando menos, proveer su propia manutención. Así como los hombres dignos y trabajadores ven con desprecio a los vagos y desocupados, así las obreras no aprecian a las inútiles y desocupadas. The modern woman, aware and recognizing the need to contribute her part to the people in the educational development of nations prepares herself bravely and invades the fields of industry in all of its faces without fear, without laziness. She abandons all idleness and inactivity because in current times, so full of life opportunities, so replete with energy and hope, there is no place for social loafers. Inaction, indolence are today seen as contemptible and as such, They are rejected by all those who may consider themselves to be factors in the development and progress of nations. The modern woman does not spend her days lounging in her comfortable armchair. Not even a rich woman does this, since also those who have been flattered by fortune dedicated themselves to the practice of charity or the philanthropic works, to the organization of charitable or recreational clubs, because what is wanted is to do something useful for themselves or for their fellow men. The working woman, by recognizing her rights, raises her head in pride and gets ready for the struggle. The time of her degradation has passed. She is no longer the slave sold for a few coins. She is no longer the servant of, but the equal to men, his partner, 
by his being her natural protector and not her lord or master. Much has been dealt with and written against the feminist movement. But despite the oppositionists already in California, women can now cast their vote as members of jury and can hold public office. How wrong are they? Those insaneful souls, superficial and unworthy of a good deed, critical of the woman who, pushing aside social conventions, dedicates her energies to work for something profitable or beneficial. Those who, refusing to accept the moral influence which this brings about, since a person dedicated to certain jobs or tasks has no time to busy herself with fertile and harmful things. The constant worker does more. Behind the boards of a counter, seated in front of her sewing machine, or even as an office clerk, than the lazy young lady who busies herself with going on daily visits or going through business establishments, a living funnel of gossip or vulgar stories. A single woman, both dignified and hardworking, does not demand a life at the expense of the head of the family. Whether he be a father, brother, or relative, no. A healthy woman, brave and strong, dedicates her energy, her talent to helping her family, or at the very least to provide for her own support. Just as dignified and hardworking men look with contempt on deadbeats and unemployed men, so also working women do not seem useless and unemployed women. Good evening, I'm Martha Jones, author of Vanguard, How Black Women Broke Barriers, Won the Vote, and Insisted on Equality for All. In 1893, Frances Ellen Watkins Harper was a seasoned speaker, writer, and political activist, having started out as an anti-slavery lecturer in the 1850s. She began her public life as a poet, publishing her first collection, Forest Leaves, in 1845, when she was just 20 years old. Her capacity with words meant that in a time when women at the podium were still provocative, and when Black women were too often regarded as ill-suited to public life, Watkins Harper crafted a style that permitted her to appear within the bounds of Black womanhood, while she also spoke ideas that intentionally defied them. Watkins Harper associated herself with many of the 19th century's great reform movements, abolitionism, women's suffrage, civil rights, and temperance. She was a peer to figures like Frederick Douglass and Susan B. Anthony, often facing off against them. By 1893, when she delivered her speech, Woman's Political Future, our last piece of this evening, Watkins Harper was among those black women activists who proclaimed that it was their time. She had just one year earlier released her most widely read novel, Iola Leroy, or Shadows Uplifted. Anna Julia Cooper had just published her black feminist manifesto, A Voice from the South. And a few years later, Watkins Harper would be among those to found the National Association of Colored Women, which would grow into the largest black women's political organization in the country. Jim Crow was on the rise in the US in 1893, and black women like Frances Ellen Watkins Harper were determined to guide black Americans through the fray. I'm pleased to present our reader, actor Krista Gonzalez. If before sin had cast its deepest shadows or sorrow had distilled its bitterest tears, it was true that it was not good for man to be alone. It is no less true since the shadows have deepened and life's sorrows increased that the world has need of all the spiritual aid that a woman can give for the social advancement and moral development of the human race. The tendency of the present age with its restlessness, religious upheavals, failures, blunders, and crimes is toward broader freedom, an increase of knowledge, the emancipation of thought, and a recognition of the brotherhood of man. In this movement, woman, as the companion of man, must be a sharer. So close is the bond between man and woman that you cannot raise one 
without lifting the other. The world cannot move without women sharing in the movement. And to help give a right impetus to that movement is woman's highest privilege. If the 15th century discovered America to the old world, the 19th is discovering woman to herself. Little did Columbus imagine when the new world broke upon his vision like a lovely gem in the coronet of the universe, the glorious possibilities of a land where the sun should be our engraver, the winged lightning our messenger, and steam our beast of burden. But as mind is more than matter and the highest ideal always the true real, so to woman comes the opportunity to strive for richer and grander discoveries than ever gladdened the eye of the Genesee Mariner. Not the opportunity of discovering new worlds, but that of filling this old world with fairer and higher aims than the greed of gold and the lust of power is hers. Through weary, wasting years men have destroyed, dashed in pieces and overthrown. But today we stand on the threshold of women's era and woman's work is grandly constructive. In her hands are possibilities whose use or abuse must tell upon the political life of the nation and send their influence for good or evil across the track of unborn ages. As the saffron tints and crimson flushes of morn herald the coming day, so the social and political advancement which woman has already gained bears the promise of the rising of the full-orbed sun of emancipation. The result will be not to make home less happy, but society more holy. Yet I do not think the mere extension of the ballot a panacea for all the ills of our national life. What we need today is not simply more voters, but better voters. Today there are red-handed men in our republic who walk unwhipped of justice, who richly deserve to exchange the ballot of the freemen for the wristlets of the felon. Brutal and cowardly men who torture, burn, and lynch their fellow men, men whose defenselessness should be their best defense and their weakness an ensign of protection. More than the changing of institutions, we need the development of a national conscience and the upbuilding of a national character. Men may boast the aristocracy of blood may glory in the aristocracy of talent and be proud of the aristocracy of wealth. But there is one aristocracy which must ever outrank them all, and that is the aristocracy of character. And it is the women of a country who help to mold its character and to influence, if not determine, its destiny. And in the political future of our nation, woman will not have done what she could if she does not endeavor to have our republic stand foremost among the nations of the earth, wearing sobriety as a crown and righteousness as a garment and a girdle. In coming into her political estate, woman will find a mass of illiteracy to be dispelled. If knowledge is power, ignorance is also power. The power that educates wickedness may manipulate and dash against the pillars of any state when they are undermined and honeycombed by injustice. I envy neither the heart nor the head of any legislator who has been born to an inheritance of privileges, who has behind him ages of education, dominion, civilization, and Christianity, if he stands opposed to the passage of a national education bill whose purpose is to secure education to the children of those who were born under the shadow of institutions which made it a crime to read. Today, women hold in their hands influence and opportunity, and with these, they have already opened doors which have been closed to others. By opening doors of labor, woman has become a rival claimant 
for at least some of the wealth monopolized by her stronger brother. In the home, she's the priestess. In society, the queen. In literature, she is a power. In legislative halls, lawmakers have responded to her appeals and for her sake have humanized and liberalized their laws. The press has felt the impress of her hand. In the pews of the church, she constitutes the majority. The pulpit has welcomed her. And in the school, she has the blessed privilege of teaching children and youth. To her is apparently coming the added responsibility of political power. And what she now possesses should only be the means of preparing her to use the coming power for the glory of God and the good of mankind. For power without righteousness is one of the most dangerous forces in the world. Political life in our country has plowed in muddy channels and needs the infusion of clearer and cleaner waters. I am not sure that women are naturally so much better than men that they will clear the stream by the virtue of their womanhood. It is not through sex, but through character that the best influence of women upon the life of the nation must be exerted. I do not believe in unrestricted and universal suffrage for either men or women. I believe in moral and educational tests. I do not believe that the most ignorant and brutal man is better prepared to add value to the strength and durability of the government than the most cultured, upright, and intelligent woman. I do not think that willful ignorance should swamp earnest intelligence at the ballot box, nor that educated wickedness, violence, and fraud should cancel the votes of honest men. The unsteady hands of a drunkard cannot cast the ballot of a freeman. The hands of lynchers are too red with blood to determine the political character of the government for even four short years. The ballot in the hands of woman means power added to influence. How well she will use that power, I cannot foretell. Great evils stare us in the face that need to be throttled by the combined power of an upright manhood and an enlightened womanhood. And I know that no nation can gain its full measure of enlightenment and happiness if one half of it is free and the other half is fettered. The elements of a nation's weakness must be ever found at the hearthstone. More than the increase of wealth, the power of armies, and the strength of fleets is the need of good homes, of good fathers, and good mothers. The life of a Roman citizen was in danger in ancient Palestine, and men had bound themselves with a vow that they would eat nothing until they had killed the Apostle Paul. Pagan Rome threw around that imperiled life a bulwark of living clay consisting of 470 human hearts, and Paul was saved. Surely the life of the humblest American citizen should be as well protected in America as that of a Roman citizen in heathen Rome. A wrong done to the weak should be an insult to the strong. Woman coming into her kingdom will find enthroned three great evils for whose overthrow she should be as strong in a love of justice and humanity as the warrior is in his might. She will find intemperance sending its flood of shame and death and sorrow to the homes of men, a fretting leprosy in our politics and a blighting curse in our social life. The social evil sending to our streets women whose laughter is sadder than their tears, who slide from the paths of sin and shame to the friendly shelter of the grave, and lawlessness enacting in our republic deeds over which angels might weep if heaven knows sympathy. How can any woman 
send petitions to Russia against the horrors of Siberian prisons if, ages after the Inquisition has ceased to devise its tortures, she has not done all she could by influence, tongue, and pen to keep men from making bonfires of the bodies of real or supposed criminals. Oh, women of America, into your hands, God has pressed one of the sublimest opportunities that ever came into the hands of women of any race or people. It is yours to create a healthy public sentiment, to demand justice, simple justice, as the right of every race, to brand with everlasting infamy the lawless and brutal cowardice that lynches, burns, and tortures your own countrymen, to grapple with the evils which threaten to undermine the strength of the nation and to lay magazines of powder under the cribs of future generations is no child's play. Let the hearts of the women of the world respond to the song of the herald of angels of peace on earth and goodwill to men. Let them throb as one heart unified by the grand and holy purpose of uplifting the human race, and humanity will breathe freer, and the world will grow brighter. With such a purpose, Eden would spring up in our path, and paradise be around our way. Thank you. Be well.